All right, so just want to welcome everyone in person and online. And uh, what I want to do for about five minutes is talk about the next 21 days that start tomorrow. And then after that, I'm going to get into the next teaching on indwelling life. But if, uh, if you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 17. It's a very uh, familiar verse of scripture for those who've been part of us for a while. But it's talking about John the Baptist. We'll start in verse 16. Uh, talking about John the Baptist, and it says, uh, the angel was talking here and speaking to Zacharias and said that he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. Talking about John the Baptist. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So I just want you to, to set the context here as we talk about the next 21 days of seeking the Lord is John the Baptist was one forerunner sent to the nation of Israel before the first coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I, I was just curious to know how many people lived in Israel at the time of Jesus and John the Baptist. And I asked ChatGPT, not always reliable, but they... But Chat GPT said, We're not, we, no one knows for sure, but there's between 500,000 to 1 million Israelites, people who lived in Israel when, during the time of Jesus' ministry. So God raised up one vessel, John the Baptist. He anointed him with the spirit and the power of Elijah. That basically just means the Holy Spirit's anointing. It wasn't like the reincarnation of Elijah. It was not Elijah's spirit transported to John. It was the Holy Spirit's anointing. The Holy Spirit's prophetic anointing on John the Baptist that had a specific prophetic anointing that was aimed at making ready God's people. It was aimed at turning many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God and making ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so if you think about this, there was one John the Baptist sent to a nation of let's just say 750,000 people before the first coming of Jesus Christ to make them ready for his first coming. Think about the, the need for an army of John the Baptist when there's 8 billion people and he's coming not just to Israel, but he's coming to the entire world. You see the, do you see the great need? And you, if you know what's happening in the world, you know what's happening in the church, there is the need for messengers anointed in the spirit and the power of Elijah with the Holy Spirit's anointing to make the church ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so we are going, uh, myself, dad, and Michael, we are going February uh, 16th through February 29th for about two weeks. We're going to Africa to, to gather together 25 to 30 of our leaders from many different countries in Africa and we are going there with one mission to equip them to be messengers that would make the bride ready in Africa. And so my point in saying all that is we are going on a mission. I want you to think of January and February and March as being a missional, missional months. We have not been in missional mode for a while with COVID and all the recovery and all that happened. But we're in, we're in missional mode right now as a church. This, this must be more than just me, Dad, and Michael. I'm telling you, the, the, the implications, it's a Gideon's army kind of phenomenon because if you think about it, we, we just graduated 2,800 pastors. They just went through our program all over Eastern and Southern Africa. 2,800 pastors, that means 2,800 churches. That means you know 2,800 times 50, which is the average size of the church in Africa. But over the last 10 years, we probably have trained 10,000 pastors, which means about half a million people. But we, we really are sensing the Lord saying the, the importance of making sure that this is not just a Bible school they're getting, that they need a Bible school because they need theological training, but it's not just a Bible school they're getting, but it's you make sure that you are preparing a bride in Africa. And so we're going there with that mission to train and equip these pastors to make ready, like John the Baptist, make ready a people prepared for the Lord in Eastern and Southern Africa. Who knows? It may go all over the continent of Africa. I don't know. But we're going on a mission 
And, you know, work, the way I think about it is, is you know, you, you here who will stay home are like the bow, and we are the arrow that is being shot out. And so I want to just kind of stir you up a little bit in terms of becoming missionally minded. And so what we're doing, because we're probably rusty, is we're going to do 21 days of seeking the Lord. I, I, I'm not calling it 21 days of fasting because I don't want the focus to be on fasting because the focus is on getting prepared. The focus is on consecration with fasting because I know I've been on enough fast to know you can do fasting and if, if fasting from food, if it's not really centered on a mission or a purpose or on the Lord himself, all you can do is become grumpy, irritable, and just, you know, frankly, too tired to do anything. And what good was that? You mean, okay, you lost 10, 15 pounds. That's better than nothing. But at the end of the day, the mission wasn't accomplished. I, I, I'm framing this as 21 days of seeking the Lord. And so I want to encourage you to, we're starting tomorrow, uh, January the 8th through January the 29th. I want to encourage you to seek the Lord. How would he have you to participate? Um, and how would he have you to fast? And so, you know, we're going to, pray, we're going to be praying on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. But even if you can't join us in prayer, but how would he have you to fast? And just, you know, I just want to be transparent about how I'm fasting. I'm, I've done enough of these fasts to know it's, it's really hard for me working and all that i got to do to fast for 21 straight days. So I just don't want you to think, okay, he's fasting 21 days and you go off and fast and you're miserable. That, you know, when I'm actually not doing that. So I just want to be transparent is what I'm doing in these 21 days is I'm, I'm fasting sugar. Maybe that's a word of knowledge for everyone. Um, you're like, ooh, no, not that. I'm fasting sugar. I'm fasting from uh, 6.30 p.m. to 10.30 a.m. I'm fasting Wednesday and Sunday until 6 p.m. And then I'm, this one sounds, might not be like, well, that's not hard. I'm fasting Twitter. Uh, I'm fasting Twitter for 21 days. And no, that's not hard. I, I you know, between, <laughs> between following different things going on in the church and following the transfer portal and college football, <laughs> I probably have become... A little addicted to Twitter. I need to. I'm going on a 21-day fast of Twitter. Really, social, all social media, but I don't really. The other ones I don't really get into. But Twitter. But you know, that's what I'm doing. I just want to encourage you. How you know to participate. You know, to ask the Lord. How, what would He have you give up? What would He have you to do to participate in this 21 days of fasting and seeking the Lord? And the real goal is to consecrate yourself for Him for this new year but also to consecrate yourself as that bow that is launching us out as the arrow into apostolic and prophetic ministry that's going to train and equip pastors in Eastern and Southern Africa, our mentors, our leadership team, in a, in a new anointing of the Holy Spirit to be messengers and master builders, forerunners that are making ready a people prepared for the Lord. We need you. We need you. We need your prayers we need your wholeheartedness. You know, we're going and, you know, it's a sacrifice for us and our families. And I just want to just, this fasting, this preparation will help you get consecrated and set apart for the mission that we're going on as a community, as a church. This has to be a community church mission, not just me, dad, and uh, Michael going, okay? So, amen, amen, and amen. Just hopefully... You will join in us, uh, join with us in that. So that's my end of my little sp uh, motivational speech. Uh, now I want to let's go ahead now and let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter six, and we are going to be continuing here before we go to Africa. We're going to be continuing here in our teaching on indwelling life. This is session seventeen, uh, session seventeen, part one. And the title of this message is Spiritual Alignment. Spiritual Alignment, part one. We'll probably do two, maybe three sessions on spiritual alignment. But we've been going through eight, we've already gone through eight different principles uh, or laws of the Spirit-led life. How we implement these laws to live by the Spirit, to live by the life of Jesus Christ. And from the notes, I'm just going to read this. It's... Uh, the eighth principle that we're going to examine is this, is you must rely upon the indwelling spirit to align your living condition. And I'm going to explain that clearly so you understand what I mean. Your living condition, and I've said this, how much you experience of the finished work of the cross to your legal position 
in Christ. And so that's where we're going in this session here. In the next, the next three uh, sessions will be focused on that. Now let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, or, or actually Romans chapter 6. Romans is the heart of the gospel. The book of Romans, if you want to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, and when people talk about it, it's all about the gospel, it's all about the gospel. The book of Romans explains the gospel like no other book in the Bible. And Romans, the book of Romans is the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It goes through justification, sanctification, atonement, all that God did, and the indwelling spirit of God that is making many sons and bringing many sons to glory. But Romans chapter 6, to me, is the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel, the heart of the book of Romans, is found in Romans chapter 6, after Paul has explained imputed righteousness and justification, Paul comes now in Romans chapter 6, and we're going to read, we're going to read just uh, verse 1 through verse six, uh, 7, just to set the context for where we're going today. As Paul said, what, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Did you know that Paul was accused of teaching hypergrace? Paul was accused by many, many people. You're teaching, they didn't call it hyper grace back then, but you're, we call it that today. But basically, are you saying then that we should just continue in sin so that grace may increase? That's what Paul was accused of because he was saying that, that it's not about your works, it's about his work. It's not about what you do, it's about what he's done. It's not about, you know, you doing all this stuff for God. It's about what Jesus Christ did when he said it is finished and you were justified and imputed righteousness was imputed to you and you were saved. And then people were saying, Paul, well, that means if you just teach justification by faith, then people can just live this lifestyle however they want to live. And Paul was accused of being taking grace to an extreme. And Paul's like, I never said that. Verse 2, may it never be. And what, he, what Paul was saying is like, there's a foundational misunderstanding you have is how shall we who died to sin still live in it? That's really what Paul was hitting at here is the hyper-grace people who said, oh, Paul's teaching hyper-grace, Paul's teaching you can live a law lawless lifestyle, and Paul's like, absolutely not. You don't understand a fundamental truth here. You died to sin. How could you still live in sin? And he talks and he asks this question, verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus? He's talking about when you were baptized in water and the Holy Spirit took that symbolic act and made it actually a, a true spiritual experience and he baptized you into the body of Jesus Christ, when you were baptized into Christ Jesus, did you realize, he's asking the Romans this, that you were baptized into his death? His death became your death. Verse 4, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, and I want you to catch this, so that as Christ was raised from the dead... Through the glory of the Father, so too we may walk in newness of life. Newness of life is indwelling life. Paul was saying there's this theological concept, and in Romans chapter 6 is, I'm telling you from experience, is one of the deepest, most complicated, but most incredible passages of Scripture in uh, or pa pa chapters in the Bible. I just want to say, go deep in Romans chapter 6. Go deep in this. But Paul was basically saying, you, you, you died in the body of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's kind of theological. It's theory. But Paul's saying, if you understand that, it helps you to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. I remember many, many years ago, there was uh, a, a person who used to go to our church. I'm going to call her Sally, okay? And I remember I taught on Romans chapter 6, and after, Sally does not go to our church. But Sally came up to me, and after I taught on Romans chapter 6, and she was like, eh, 
I just remember this, the laugh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't have a clue what you just talked about. And it's probably because I didn't do a very good job of teaching, but I said, okay, yeah, it's very important. And, but, you know, it was almost like this attitude. And the reason I said that is I could tell those listening, well, uh, sorry, that would be you. So I better not say that out loud. I could tell some, and they, they all don't go to this church anymore. Some who were there that don't go to this church anymore were listening, kind of had the same attitude of like, I don't have a clue what you're talking about, but I don't really uh, care to know what you're talking about. It's just impractical theory, no application to my life. Uh, I mean, she didn't say this, but it was kind of her attitude. And it was like, I was just grieved by that because Romans chapter six to me is a gold mine. It is precious jewels. Now, is it easy to understand what Paul's saying? No, it's very difficult. It's taking me I'm talking 20 years, and I haven't studied this like only this, this, but it's taken me 20 years of going deep and praying and like coming back to it periodically and saying, Lord, what is this saying? What is this teaching? I, I you know, even now I probably have just a, a just a, a small measure of understanding of Romans chapter six, but it's incredibly powerful if you get revelation of it. If you get revelation of it, it's life-changing. And that's really my heart is, is may God give us revelation of Romans chapter 6 and what it means to be included in the death of Jesus Christ, what it means to be identified in the death of Jesus Christ, what it means to be identified in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if you get this, this is what Paul is saying here in verse 4. If you get this, he says, therefore... We have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so too we may walk in newness of life. Paul was making the connection of your identification with the death of Jesus Christ, your inclusion in his death through the baptism of, of the Spirit of God into the body of Jesus Christ has practical value to you because it is, the, it is one of the keys to living by his indwelling life. Verse 5, for if we have become united, that word, oh, it's a, I, I just encourage you to look that up in the Greek, blue letter Bible, look it up. That word united means growing together with. Some have even used it as, as to mean grafted. So what Paul's saying is, I believe the depth of what Paul's saying in this verse is he's, say, is he's saying the Holy Spirit, when he, the Holy Spirit came to regenerate you and he recreated your spirit and he joined himself to your spirit. And he was, remember one of the sessions I talked about being, gra the spirit of God was grafted to our human spirit. And the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead was grafted to your human spirit. Literally, literally your spirit right now, if you're born again, is touching the spirit of God. Your spirit is touching the Spirit of God and is always touching the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is grafted to your human spirit. And what Paul is saying here is now you are grow. This is what this Greek word means, to grow together with. The implantation of the Spirit of God into your human spirit, the grafting of the Spirit of God to your human spirit, making your human spirit one spirit with him, that implantation has now caused you to grow together with Christ, and it also placed you, this is uh, verse 5, into the likeness of his death. You did not experience his death because you weren't born. That was 2,000 years ago. But when Paul says the likeness of his death, I think what he's really meaning here is into the identification with his death. I'm going to explain that in more detail in a minute. That certainly also, because you've been included in his death and you're identified in his death, certainly also you will be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. This is not talking about an experiential crucifixion. There is a place for experiential crucifixion. When the Holy Spirit puts to death your self-life, when the Holy Spirit puts to death the deeds of your body, that is experientially applying the cross. Paul's talking here 
about your inclusion into the historic cross of Jesus Christ when you were reckoned to have died with Jesus in him when he died. Paul saying this, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. In order that the body of sin might be done away with, the better translation there is in order that the body of sin would be rendered powerless. This body of sin that wants to go and disobey God and do our own thing and do whatever we want, when we want it, how we want it, this body of sin that wants to just gratify itself, Paul says, because your old self died in Christ, was crucified in Christ, because of that, this body of sin now has been rendered powerless because now the indwelling Spirit of God has come inside of you. His Spirit literally touches your spirit, is joined to your spirit, is grafted to your spirit, and the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is now giving life to your spirit, flowing out of your spirit into your heart, soul, and body so that now this body of sin has been rendered powerless. People struggle with sin because they think this sin is too much for this body to handle. My body is, has sin, indwelling sin in it. Yes, that's true. But we don't understand that through the cross of Jesus Christ, the body of sin, the body that wants to go off and sin, has been rendered powerless, ineffective, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who, ha for he who has died is freed from sin. That word actually freed means justified from sin. Because in the body of Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross and you were included in his death, when he died as that penal substitution, as he died as a substitute in our place, we died in him. And because we died to sin in the body of Jesus Christ, we now, our punishment for sin has been paid through Jesus Christ. And now, we are free of sin. We've been justified. So that's just seven verses, but it's deep. And if you're going, I don't understand, you know, I'm probably, I'm, yeah, I don't understand that much either. But we're, we're plumbing the depths of this. This is, I just want to encourage you, read Romans chapter 6 and ask the Lord to teach you. I'm going to do my best to explain what Paul's talking about here, the difference between your legal position in Christ and your living condition in Christ by the Spirit. You know, it, it's one of those things like you, you probably did not wake up this morning, raise your hand, and you thought, okay, I wonder what is the difference between my legal position in Christ and my living condition because Christ is in me? Raise your hand if you thought about that this morning. Yeah, I mean, I'm the only one that did because I had to preach about it. But I'm pretty sure that's not something that was on your, the forefront of your mind. You're probably thinking, just, i got to get the kids ready. I, I'm running late. Brian will get mad to me if I'm late. Um, i got to take care of my family. i got to pay the bills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if, if you really just paused for a second and, and said, okay, if I can understand the the, this theological question is what is the difference between my legal position in Christ and my living condition because Christ is in me? If I can answer that question, I'm telling you there's immense practical value in your life. So, because this is the key to gaining more and more of the life of Christ in you and releasing more and more and more of the indwelling of life of Christ out of you as a river of life that flows out of you into many, many people's lives around you. So this is not just we're, we're just bored and we're trying to understand theology. No, this has incredible practical value when you understand what Paul's teaching here. So I, would, I just want to walk through real quick, and we're going to show the slides here, is the difference between your legal position and your living condition. Your legal position is what Christ finished for you on the cross. That's basically what we just read in Romans chapter 6. Your legal position is what Christ finished for you on the cross. Your living condition is what the Spirit has finished in your spirit because you're now joined to Him and is now finishing in your heart, soul, and body. And as the Spirit finishes that work, that's called sanctification. Your legal position hinges on identification. 
And I'm going to explain identification in a minute just to, so we get an idea of what identification means. In fact, let me just share this one example. I, I read this great example by a scholar named Leroy Fourlines in his book, Classical Armeni Armenianism. Raise your hand if you asked for that for Christmas. But it's, it's a really good book. I'm probably the only nerd out there that enjoyed it. But he told this great analogy of, to illustrate what identification is. And he said, okay, before Hawaii became the 50th state in the United States, Hawaii could not say on July 4th that we celebrate Independence Day because Hawaii is not part of the United States. But when Hawaii became the 50th state in the, of the United States of America, on July 4th, Hawaii could then begin to say, we celebrate our independence. See, what happened was Hawaii was not in the United States and therefore could not participate in our history. But now Hawaii, when Hawaii was joined into the United States, Hawaii could now say that history that happened in 1776 and when America declared our independence, Hawaii could now say we celebrate our independence. What happened was Hawaii by union, Hawaii by inclusion, Hawaii by becoming part of the United States could now be identified with the history of the United States. I thought that was a great example by Leroy Fourlines. And, you know, just, just to think about that, that God did that in your life. Before you were born again, you could not say, I have been crucified with Jesus Christ. I have been buried with Jesus Christ. I have died in Jesus Christ. I have been resurrected in Jesus Christ. I have ascended in Jesus Christ. I have been enthroned in Jesus Christ. But when you were born again, what happened? On the condition of faith, when the Spirit of God regenerated your human spirit and recreated your spirit and put His Spirit inside of you and joined you to Jesus Christ, and now on the condition of faith, you are in union with Christ, you are in Christ, because now you are in Christ, you are now identified with His resurrection and His burial and His crucifixion. You can now say, I have been crucified with Jesus Christ. I have been buried with Jesus Christ. I have been resurrected with Jesus Christ. I have ascended with Jesus Christ. I have been enthroned with Jesus Christ. Because you are in union with him by the Holy Spirit on the condition of faith, you now are identified with the historical death of Jesus Christ so that like Paul said in Romans chapter 6, you have died in him. You have been crucified in him. That's your legal position. Your living condition, now that, if you can be born again, and that can all be true, but you can be filled with sin and self and just living just a, a sinful life because that, that position has no practical application. You have no experience in it. And that's what we say, your living condition depends upon experience. See, your legal position is you died when Christ died because you're in him. Your living condition is now the Spirit of God is working the death of Christ into me, putting to death my selfishness, putting to death my sin, so that now the life of Christ is now rising up within me. See, it's the difference between identification and experience. We must have this experience. The gap between our legal position and our living condition must be closed by faith in what Jesus Christ accomplished for us on the cross. And then when we apply our faith to that, the Holy Spirit closes that gap so that what's true about Christ now becomes true about you and me. Your legal position, this is again legal words, is constituted. It's imputed. It's reckoned. Because you're in Christ, his righteousness is imputed to you. Because you're in Christ, his death is now imputed to you. Because you're in Christ, his crucifixion is now imputed to you. But your living condition is life-based, actualized, and incarnated. In other words, what God wants to do more then you just having a true, something true about you legally, God wants to make it true practically. God wants to make it true by experience. See, your legal position is an accomplished fact. 
See, if you're born again, you were crucified in him. If you were born again, you died in him. If you were, cruci- if you were born again, you are righteous in him. That's an accomplished fact, whether you believe it or not, whether you feel it or not, the accomplished fact is you are in Christ and whatever is of Christ has been imputed to you. That's your legal position. Your living condition is determined by your faith in these facts. See, faith substantiates. See, well, you know, we, a lot of times we talk about faith for healing, faith for a breakthrough, faith for finances, faith for healing in a relationship, faith to advance in your career, faith, you know, for whatever it is in your life, faith for a breakthrough, faith for these things that are promises, but we don't think about faith in the facts of what's already been accomplished. And so when we put our faith in what has been already accomplished when Jesus said, it is finished, and what the Spirit of God finished in our spirit when we were born again, when we put our faith in Christ and what he did, what the Spirit of God who always operates by faith, if you want the Holy Spirit to move in your life, he's not going to move in your life with doubt and unbelief. Jesus said, you must be converted and become like children to enter the kingdom of heaven. The older we get, the more cynical we get. Isn't that true? The more you know, distrusting, and we, we've seen, we've seen, we've been around the block, we've bought the t-shirt, we've done all the stuff, we're more cynical, and that's why Jesus said, you got to become like children. I'm not talking about being naive, but I'm talking about childlike faith, and when, because faith is how the Spirit of God begins to move. We were, me and Angie were talking about this yesterday, it's like, I love the fact as you get older, you get more and more discernment, and you go, yeah, that's not the Lord, that's not the Lord, that's not the Lord. What I miss is I feel like when I was younger, I was experiencing the Lord more because I had more faith. Yeah, some of the stuff was not the Lord, but I I did experience more of him by faith because I had the faith of a child. And so my point here is your living condition, your living condition is determined by faith faith in what, this, what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross and what the Holy Spirit did in your spirit when you were born again. So that's the difference between your legal position and your living condition. Now let's talk now, and for the rest of this message, we're going to talk about uh, three things. We're going to go deeper into, the, into your legal position, what it means in your legal position, and, and don't zone out Okay, this, this has practical, practical value with your war against lust or anger or coveting or insecurity or rejection or whatever it would be. This has practical value in, in your life. But there's three things that we're going to talk about is, number one is you are in Christ by God's doing. How did you get into Christ? By God's doing. We're going to talk about that. Number two, Jesus Christ is your representative in the new covenant. We're going to talk about what that means. And then number three, you were baptized into, into the body of Jesus Christ at new birth. Okay, so that's where we're going here for the rest of this session. So John 14, 20, Jesus said, in that day, you will know that I am in the Father. And this is where, this last part is where we're going to talk about today. You will know that you are in me. That's what we're talking about today. You are in Christ, and I am in you. We've been talking however many sessions we've done. So much of it has been focused on Christ in you, Christ in you, Christ in you. That's, that's vital. That's vital. But we haven't focused much on you in Christ and what that means. And so we're going to talk about that today, what it means to be in Christ, because we already know what it means for Christ to be in us. But both are required to live the life God wants us to live. So that, that's where we're headed. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, Paul told the Corinthians, I love this, by his doing, by his doing, Not by your doing. You can't work up the machine for this to happen. You can't grit your teeth and discipline yourself for this to happen. Paul says, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. How did you get into Christ Jesus? 
By God's doing. How did you get into Christ Jesus? By God's doing. On the condition of faith, when you put your faith into Jesus Christ and his finished work, the Spirit of God regenerated you, baptized you into the body of Christ, and by God's doing, put you into Christ. That is a completely, solely work of God that we could never do in and of ourselves. You are in Jesus Christ. You are in Christ. And Paul said, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now, if you look at the phrase in Christ, if you go on blueletterbible.org and type in Christ or in him and you, you limit the search to the New Testament, what you'll find is that 88 times in the New American Standard Version, this is mentioned in the New Testament. That, isn't that staggering? 88 times, and, and mostly by Paul, the, the, the New Testament writers talk about being in Christ. Now, that's, that's different than Christ being in you. You being in Christ and what that means. 88 times that's happened. And then I'm not going to go through all the notes in this or all the verses in, the, in, the, in this message, but in the notes, there's, there's many different verses you can look at. But I'm just going to summarize with this, that in Christ, you have been crucified, buried, and resurrected. This means you have died to sin, to self, and to the law. This also means your spirit has been resurrected and you're now alive to God. In Christ, you have ascended with him. You are seated with him in heaven and are an overcomer. In Christ, you are also righteous, have been made complete, and are an heir to every spiritual blessing. All that's true of who you are in Christ, but it's not true of who you are in experience. See, you see the difference? Who you are in Christ are all these things. Who you are in experience, you could be being overcome, living, in, living a selfish, sinful life, but in Christ, these things are true about you. God wants to close that gap between who you are in Christ and how Christ, who Christ is in you. That's the difference between your legal position and your living condition. So just to give you a couple of examples here of what it means to be in Christ. Okay, so in a month or so, me and Dad and Michael are going to get into an airplane. I've not flown since 2018, so it's like, oh, gosh, I've got to get in, you know, all the claustrophobic, you know, I'm like dreading all the, you know, it's all tight and smelly and, you know, virusy and all that stuff, so you, you can pray for me. But we're going to get into a plane, and we're going to fly from Atlanta to Paris and then Paris to Nairobi. And when we get into that plane, our destiny is tied to that plane. You know, we may, want to be, we may want to be going to Ireland to visit our friends in Northern Ireland, Kat and, uh, Kat and her husband. <clears throat> we may want to go there, huh? We may want to go there, but if the plane is going to Paris, we're going to Paris. Even if we want to go here, we're going there because we are in the plane. Okay, if we have mechanical issues and have to land in Boston, that's not going to happen, but I'm just saying if that were to happen, we're going to land in Boston. Our destiny is tied to the plane, so whatever happens to the plane happens to us because we're in the plane. That's what it means by God's doing. By God's doing, you are in Jesus Christ. By God's doing, you are in him. And because you are in him by God's doing, your history, your destiny, your experience, your future, all that is about your life is tied up with him. That's about becoming identified with Jesus Christ, becoming identified with him. So you're going wherever that plane goes. Another example here is in your cell phone, you have a SIM card. I, I, I think this is still true about the modern cell phones, but... Your, your SIM card stores your identity, location, phone number, network authorization data, personal security keys, and stored text messages. So if you want this phone to work, you've got to have your SIM card in your phone. Because if you take your SIM card out and you go to the mountains, then your phone's not going to work. So for your phone to work, you've got to have the SIM card in the phone. So the SIM card's destiny is tied to this phone. 
The SIM card's experience is tied to this phone because the SIM card is in the phone. If you go to the mountains, your SIM card is going with it. If you go to the beach and you, and you bring your phone, your SIM card is going with it. The destiny of the SIM card is tied to the phone. Now, again, that's the same thing with being in Christ. Your history and your destiny are tied in him. You are in Jesus Christ. A third example is marriage. Is, you know, the scriptures say, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. I know when I do, do weddings, I'm always like, you know, I have so many things running through my head. I'm always afraid I'm going to actually say, for this reason, I'm going to get the, the, the genders wrong and you know, screw up in a wedding. But anyway, for a sermon, it's okay. Not really okay, but it's easier. Not as narrow as stressful. But when, when, you, when, you, when a husband and wife get married, everything, everything that's true about the wife now becomes true about the husband. Everything that's true about the husband now becomes true about the wife. If, you're, if your husband is wealthy, then the wife is going to become wealthy. If your husband has medical issues, then those medical issues are going to affect the wife. If your husband has family issues, well, you're marrying into those very fun fi family dynamics. So whatever is true about the husband and, and the wife in marriage becomes true about the other partner. See, that's, that's what's happening when we are being joined to Christ in, 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 in the born-again experience, in union with him, what's true of Christ now becomes true of you, and what's true of you has now been laid upon Christ. Your sin, my sin, was imputed to Christ. Jesus Christ became sin so that we would become the righteousness of God in him. He took all of our junk and all of our sin and all of our shortcoming on the cross and was crucified with us our sins imputed to him so that we could become his righteousness. And I, and I already shared the example about Hawaii joining the United States. So let me just summarize this. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you're born again, the reason I'm repeating this over, you might, you're saying like, you just said that, you just said that. I'm just saying it over and over and over because it's a complicated subject and repetition is the best teacher. So, I'm saying it over and over and over again because I just want to get it deeper and deeper into our minds of the, the power of this truth, the depth of this truth. is When you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you were born again, everything about Jesus Christ is imputed to you. As a result, you become the righteousness of God in him. The Lord's crucifixion, burial, death, and resurrection are imputed to you so that in God's eyes, you are reckoned to have been crucified, buried, and resurrected with him. And I just list here some bullet points we looked at in Romans chapter 6. That means you died to sin. Uh, Romans chapter 6 verse 2. That means you were baptized into his death. Romans 6 verse 3. That means you were buried with him into death. Verse 4. That means you were not united with him in the likeness of his death and resurrection. Verse 5. That means your old self was crucified with him. Verse 6. That means we have died with him. Verse 8. That means we are dead to sin and no alive to God. Verse 11. See, as your substitute, Christ became sin and a sin offering to atone for your sins. As your substitute, Christ absorbed the condemnation and the wrath you deserve so that you never have to experience this yourself. And as your substitute, Christ died instead of you so you did not have to die for your sins. Praise God for that. As your representative, though, and I'm making a distinction between Christ as our substitute in Christ as our representative, as your representative, you were included in Christ's death so that his death became your death. His, his resurrection became the ability for you to walk in newness of life. This means for all who have union with Jesus Christ in the condition of faith that you were included on, on the cross with Jesus Christ and you died when he died. You were crucified when, you, when he was crucified. So, Paul, again, I'm not going to go through this again, but Paul tied all of that in Romans chapter 6 to say, therefore, so too, you now can walk in newness of life. When you realize these things, these incredible life-changing things, when you realize these incredible life-changing things, the purpose of this 
is so that you could walk in newness of life. You could walk in the indwelling life. You could live by his life. You could live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the first one. You are in Christ by God's doing. How did you get into Christ? By God's doing. It was nothing you did. You just put your faith in Jesus. God put you into Christ by his doing. The second thing here is Jesus Christ is your new covenant representative. And I, I just am so thankful for the excellent teaching Dad has done over the years, teaching about covenant because we don't understand covenant. We, you know, covenant is such a foreign concept to us. We, we don't even, you know, we think we know a marriage covenant, but, you know, these days, you know, those are broken so easily. But so covenant is something we don't really think about. We don't think about covenant that much. But the entire scriptures are the old covenant and the new covenant. The word testament is actually a synonym for covenant. So when you see the entire Bible is broken up into an old covenant and a new covenant, you realize the entire scriptures are driven by, by covenant. And because we don't understand covenant and we don't understand the concepts of covenant, many times we don't understand what Paul was talking about when he says you are in Christ. And so you've got to understand when Paul was writing to the Romans, for example, Paul was writing to a people who were extremely familiar with covenant concepts. So when he says you are in Christ, you are in him, everyone would immediately know, oh, he's talking about uh, the covenant. He's talking about Christ as, a, as our covenant representative. I mean, imagine if, if like I was somehow time traveled back into the first century and I was speaking to the Romans and I said, okay, I want you to Google what imputation means. And they're like, Google? What does Google mean? You mean goggles? You know, it doesn't mean goggles. It means Google. And you have to explain because, you know, you just tell someone today in the 21st century, Google this, Google that. Every single person, you know, even a two-year-old nowadays knows what Google means. But in the first century, they would have thought that was nonsense. And we come now to the 21st century, and when we see covenant and in him and those kind of phrases, we're, it's this, we would be this, we're the same way now as they would have been in the first century if I just said Google this or Google that. You get out your cell phone. Okay, what's a cell phone? Get out, you know, go to your computer. What's a computer? They, you know, they would just be like totally clueless. And so Paul's first century audience was very much in tune with what covenant was, covenant concepts. And so Paul didn't have to go through and explain, well, covenant is a, a process where two parties become one. I remember um, many years ago, we were in Africa and dad was, this is when dad was really teaching on covenant a lot. And he was teaching to the African pastors. Um, I forget, it was maybe Kenya. And he was, or maybe Ivory, I forget, it was somewhere in Africa. And he was teaching them about covenant. And, you know, dad was reading his notes and, you know, reading his definition. And he was like, a covenant is a formal, solemn, binding, I mean, he was saying it with more emotion than that, but. Uh, binding agreement, joining two parties together as one. He was given this, you know, formal definition, and they're all like, yeah, we, all, we do covenants almost like every day. You know, I mean, it's like such a part of the, the lifestyle in Africa. It was just funny just seeing him going to try to teach people who covenant is a real part of their everyday life about what a covenant was. You know, in, in America, we don't really know um, what covenants are, but covenants were a way to bind two parties together as one, they came together in this covenant agreement, and then whenever a covenant was made by, let's just say two tribes, a covenant was made by two tribes, the, um, each tribe would have their own representative. And so whatever was true of the representative would then be imputed to or reckoned to be also true of the group. So let's just say, for example, let's just say, for example, that there's two tribes making a covenant together. There's the Exousia tribe, and the Exousia tribe is known for power. The Exousia tribe is known for warfare, and they're vowing to protect the Zoe tribe, who's known for farming and agriculture. They're, they say, we're going to enter into a covenant. Exousia and Zoe are going to enter into a covenant, and Exousia is going to say, we're going we're to give you our military power, and Zoe is saying, we're going to teach you farming and agriculture, and so out of the Zoe and Exousia tribes, say that too fast, you start speaking in tongues, but I'm trying to get it right. 
You get one tribe from Zoe, one tribe from Exusia, and the representatives are selected. And so whatever they do in that covenant ceremony, whatever agreements are made to in that covenant ceremony are then imputed to or reckoned to be true of also each of the tribes. So, for example, once they make a covenant, if the, if the uh, Zoe tribe needs protection from their enemies, anyone in that Zoe tribe, even, the, even not just a covenant representative, but anyone in that tribe could call on the Exusia tribe and say, we need your help to fight this enemy. And anyone in the Exusia tribe could call on the Zoe tribe and say, we need your help in farming. And so when the covenant representatives came together and the Exusia tribe hands them a sword and saying, we vow to protect you from your enemies. And the Zoe tribe hands them a stalk of corn and saying, we vow to give you uh, training in agriculture. That agreement is now bound in those covenant representatives. And so whatever is true in those representatives is also reckoned to be true of the members. In the new covenant that Jesus Christ cut on the cross with his father, Whatever is true about Jesus Christ as the covenant representative of man has been reckoned to be true in you. This means whatever happened to our covenant representative on the cross is reckoned because of covenant to be true about you. That's why Paul says, in Christ, you are dead to sin. That means when Paul says, in Christ, you have died to the law. That means when Paul says, in Christ, you have been crucified. In Christ, you have been resurrected. In Christ, you have ascended. In Christ, you are an overcomer. In Christ, you have been enthroned. Because whatever is true of our covenant representative in the new covenant is now imputed to everyone in him. So that also makes it true about us. And so when you understand covenant, that Jesus Christ is our covenant representative, you understand what it means to be in Christ. You can understand the 88 times when you read in the New Testament that you are in Christ, you are in him. You can understand, oh, he's talking about covenant. He's talking about my covenant representative. He's talking about whatever's true of Jesus Christ is imputed to me. Okay, number three, and we'll wrap this up here is number three is we are, our legal position is defined because we were baptized into the body of Jesus Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, for even as the body is one and yet has many members, okay, don't zone out, this is really powerful. For even as the body is one and yet has many members and all the members of the body, though they are one, Though they are many, are one body, listen, so also is Christ. What Paul's saying here is the body of Christ is Christ. Okay, that does not mean, well, let me first say what it means. That means every single member of his body that has been baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Jesus Christ it is now part of the body that has his indwelling life in them, that whose spirit has been joined to the Holy Spirit. Every single person that has been baptized into his body and is now part of the body by his indwelling life, Jesus is, or, or Paul is saying, the body of Christ is Christ. That does not mean by any stretch of the imaginations that we are little gods, that we are that we're Jesus Christ on earth, any of that, but we are the expression of his life in the earth because we have his life in us. You know, it doesn't mean that, it doesn't make us gods, but it does make us godly. Is we have the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. You have the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. When the body of Christ comes together and we express the life of Jesus Christ together, his life on earth that Paul could say the body of Christ is Christ. And then this is what's so staggering is when Paul had his Damascus Road experience and he was knocked to the ground and the light shone, the light of Jesus Christ shone down on him. And Paul, and, and Jesus Christ spoke to Paul and he said, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul was like, wait, what? How in the world am I persecuting you? 
And Jesus, was he didn't say this, but he's basically saying this, in that you were persecuting my body, in that you were persecuting my church, you were persecuting me because my body is part of me. Man, that's an incredible revelation. Then Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, by one spirit, you were all baptized into one body. This is not talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit like in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came upon the crowd gathered together to pray and they all began to speak in tongues. This is not the same baptism. This is, a, this is the baptism that happened when you were born again. Is when you were born again, the Spirit of God baptized you into the body of Christ. He, he, he made you part of that body. You are now part of Christ, His body on earth. You, you now became part of His body because you are in Him. But through this vital union of the Holy Spirit, you became actually part of His body. So that now what Jesus experienced in his body, you are now identified with in his crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. That's incredible. Man, just what that means for us in living by his life, what it means for the church, because I still don't think many people get the revelation of the, the church being the expression of the body of Christ coming together under the headship of Jesus Christ. We're so ingrained into coming to a place on Sunday to have a two-hour service with worship, preaching, and uh, uh, you know, some ministry that we forget. No, we are a body. We are a body gathered together under the ecclesia or under the headship of Jesus Christ as his church, as his ecclesia. And then in the parable, Matthew 25, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, there's so much in there. But um, Jesus said to the people, he was saying, you know, to the sheep and the goats, to the sheep, he was saying, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. And they're like, what? What? We, we gave you, we, what, what? And he's like, and the fact that you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me because... The body of Christ is Christ. It's his life in the earth. It's the expression of his life in the earth. <clears throat> and therefore, because we were baptized by the Holy Spirit at new birth into the body of Christ, we are now identified with Christ in his death, in his burial, in his crucifixion, and his resurrection. Therefore, we can make practical application to this that we can, we can see our legal position here and our living condition here, this gap closed so that we can become righteous. We're not just to become righteous by imputation or by position. We're actually called to become righteous in our character, righteous in our thinking, righteous in our deeds, righteous in our desires, righteous in our motivations. We're not just called to be crucified with Jesus Christ legally on the cross, but live in sin and for self over here. No, the cross is meant to work by experience, by the, the Spirit of God applying the cross to us inwardly inwardly, not just outwardly, not just outwardly with prayer and fasting and outward activities, but inwardly the crucifixion of the self-life so the life of Christ can be released out of us. That gap being closed by our living condition being aligned to our legal position. I mean, it's just incredible, incredible news. The moment you were born again, you became a partaker of his divine nature. That is amazing. Again, that does not make you Jesus Christ, does not make you a God. You still have right now your sinful body, the body of sin and death, but it does mean in your spirit you're a partaker of his life. You're a partaker of his divine nature. I mean, how incredible is that? And, and Paul, back, in Romans, back to Romans chapter 6, I think it's verse 5, he says, 
You were united with him. You were implanted with him. The spirit of God was grafted to your human spirit. So that now the characteristics and the DNA, the spiritual DNA of Jesus Christ is now imparted to your human spirit. So now you're growing together with him. How beautiful, man. That's why the gospel is good news. Okay, I'm going to bring this to a close. Just in summary, is our legal position is what Christ finished for us on the cross. Our living condition is what we experience by is what we have by experience. Our, our legal position is a fact, no matter if you feel like it or feel it or not. Your experience or your, li- your living condition is how much you experience by faith in that accomplished fact. If you don't have any faith for that, the spirit won't work. If you have all faith for that, the spirit will do exactly what needs to be done to align you and close that gap so your living condition and your li- legal position are aligned so that you can be who God's called you to be. And so how does that happen? Number one, by God's doing, you are in Jesus Christ. Number two, Jesus Christ is your covenant representative, so whatever is true about him has been imputed to you and reckoned to be true about you. And then number three, you are in him because you were baptized into his body, and the body of Christ is Christ. Amen. That's incredible news. Good news. Good news, good news, good news. Let me pray. Father, I just ask you right now, just first of all, Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I, I'm, I'm appreciative, Lord. I'm thankful. I'm grateful for the incredibly good news of this, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you that by God's doing, we are in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, who has become to us righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Thank you, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you would give to us a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation. Lord, that we might truly have our eyes opened. I know this is a deep subject, but I pray that it would become a revelation. An eye-opening revelation from the Lord that would be life-transforming. Lord, of what it means to be included in the the death of Christ and the crucifixion of Christ, what it means to be identified with him. Lord, would you, Lord, and I include myself in this because I feel like I've barely touched the surface. This is a deep, deep truth. Lord, I pray that you would just give us eye-opening revelation of this. Lord, in Jesus' mighty name, we love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we'll end here.